laughed at myself on the other side when I thought, oh my God, if I was human, I would try to grab onto this. But I need to remember, this is the same as it is on earth. There's a constant flow of love, beauty, abundance. It never, ever stops. We don't ever, ever, ever have to grab onto any of it. We can be present for it completely and let it have its way with us and enjoy it. And then if it, if it wants to go, then let it. If a person wants to go, let them. If a job, if a situation, whatever, if it, if it goes, then it's okay. Bye-bye. Because there's that just means something better is coming in. And that, that, if nothing else, that one thing has changed my life. This is Kelly Sullivan Walden, aka Dr. Dream, and I'm so excited to be with Trey Downs on Your Superior Self. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Kelly, thank you for taking <laughs> the time. You've done this a couple of times, huh? Uh, this is the first time you and I have done this in this lifetime, but I think we've done this many times in other lifetimes. <laughs> This isn't our first rodeo. You can't say things like that. And like, I'm like, you know what? You probably know, right? Like you're a spirituality coach. Like you're, you're on that wavelength of probably seeing that. Um, so yeah, that's very fascinating. I wanted to start this conversation out with a question. Not even, not even a question, but like a scenario, right? Like I just mm -hmm. got your best selling book. A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Right. And I read this. You are the dream doctor. Now you're writing a book about all of your crises in your life, your crises, or however they say mm -hmm. it in psychology. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a scenario in the book where you talk about if we were on a date. And <laughs> you I like and the I way was, you said that. If we're on, on a, date, a date. If we're on a date. <laughs> and this is the first time that Trey and Kelly are hanging out <laughs> in an intimate setting. What's that resume look like? Oh my God. You want to hear it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's act it out, Trey. Well, I only so, say this because this is how it's, this is how it's portrayed in the book, right? You talk about right. if you're on a date with someone and you guys were to relay information <laughs> regarding each other's pasts, you would throw out this resume and I'm like, you know, what? let's start like this, right? Like, all right, Kelly, you and I are on this hypothetical date and we're getting to know one another. Yeah. How would you start this out? <clears throat> well, first of all, let's 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 set the scene even a little bit more. This is in the from the introduction of my book. It says, so we're on this date and we're at a lovely restaurant seated in a window side booth and we just order dinner. As we sip floral wine from crystal glasses, you look across the table, <laughs> past the red rose in the vase and the flickering candle, smiling as you innocently say, say it, Trey. Oh, um, That's uh, your line. I'm so sorry. I totally not even following. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like lost in your reading. Here. Uh, let's see here. Where line? So line, tell me please. about you. So, so tell me about yourself. So tell me about yourself. Tell me. Tell me, Kelly, about yourself. <clears throat> well, I clear my throat and dab the cloth napkin to my lips, take a breath, look you intently in the eye, <clears throat> and reply, Ah, oh, thanks, Trey. I am so happy to. Yeah, there's probably a few things you should know about me if we're going to have a relationship beyond this date. First, I get my nitty gritty shitty list out of the way. I reach into my purse and say, Trey, I've prepared a document for just such an occasion. You watch spellbound as I unfurl a very, very long scroll from my purse. I clear my throat again <clears throat> and read aloud. While I pursued acting in my 20s, I had over 100 indecent hashtag MeToo-esque propositions. 
One of those led to me becoming a stripper in a bikini bar for a year. And then I was robbed five times, physically assaulted and nearly raped four times, was in three car accidents, contemplated suicide twice, was mauled by dogs once, jumped off a 60 foot high cliff and landed ass first in the water, bounced checks, dropped out of college, shoplifted, dabbled in eating disorders. I used to be irresistibly drawn to dysfunctional relationships where I was lied to, manipulated, conned, cheated on, rejected, stalked, forced to file restraining orders, and was up close and personal with the mafia. All this has led me to become a commitment phobe with a messianic complex, an insecure, codependent workaholic. In grief over the recent-ish death of over a dozen loved ones, including two lifelong best friends, Teresa and Gypsy, and most recently, my lap dogs and constant companions, Lola and Priya. But my biggest heartbreak was the death of a baby I was scheduled to adopt. And in the time it took me to tell you this, I've had one of the 50 hot flashes I'll experience today. So how do you like that? Well, now that we've gotten that out of the way, Trey, I'm going to the little girl's room. And if you're still here when I return, maybe you'll tell me about you. I don't know how I can beat that, right? Like, I don't know <laughs> if I can beat that. Now I will Your turn, say, Trey. Yes. Hi, you're still Trey here. Downs. Hi, I'm Trey. Uh, I'm turning 40. And yeah, I'm awakening to a higher consciousness. And I am trying to relearn who I am. That is all I got, right? Like I'm a sensitive guy who just realized that he's sensitive for the first time. And that he's going through all his emotional shit. And he's trying to put it all together. Mm. And it's like, you know what, let's do this together. Kelly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But all in all seriousness, it's a beautifully Ooh. written book. Mm. And I love that you put all of your crises into this document, into this, into this book, because I think the, the theme that the theme that keeps popping up in my world right now is that it is the crisis. It is the mm -hmm. crises mm -hmm. that strengthen the inner being of who we are. And we shouldn't be running from that. We shouldn't be numbing this stuff, right? Right. We should right. be going through it. I think it's it's counterintuitive to move toward the things that are difficult and painful. It's it's natural to just recoil from the things that are painful or that are difficult or that we're ashamed of. So it's there's it's not a problem that it's there's nobody nobody's at fault it's not bad if people are like ooh i don't want to talk about my shame secrets or the things i did that i'm not proud of but i found after so many years i mean two decades basically almost two decades almost a lifetime actually working with dreams but professionally for the last 20 years working with clients and myself with regards to dreams that in dreams we do everything opposite when we're working with them the things that are scary and difficult, we want to run towards those things with open arms and open heart and ask, what gift do you have in store for me? We don't want to just gloss over that because that's vital information. Everything in, in a dream is opposite. So death is actually about new life. It's about, so like a fire in, a, in waking reality would be, oh my God, destruction, it's horrible. But in a dream, it's like rebirth. So there's so many things that are just sort of opposite, but they also make their own sense when you think about it. It also makes sense in waking reality. But after so many years of doing dream work, I couldn't help but see crises from that dream perspective. Like what if what if the gold is in these these places that are so ugly and yucky? I mean, Joseph Campbell, one of my favorite Joseph Campbell quotes is, the cave you most fear to enter holds the treasures you seek hmm. Hmm. that's so beautiful yeah I, I love him i love his work um mm -hmm. <clears throat> me too why is it why are dreams like 
dreams are so hard to interpret, right? For the, if I don't read your books, right? Like if I just think nothing of it and I just wake up every day and just kind of nonchalantly go through my life and I think back on my, on my dreams, mm. they mean nothing. <laughs> really? It's just kind of like, oh, they're crazy. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I like to think that dreams and the, the language of dreams are our primary language, the language that we all speak at a cellular level. So when we're like, when you're in a creative flow, you'll start speaking of, like automatically more symbolically and you'll start all of a sudden. So if you're in a really logical, rational mode, dreams will seem ridiculous but the moment you for example if you hear a song that puts you in that altered state that ah, then all of a sudden you're thinking with a more kind of that magical that higher part of the mind that suddenly when you look at your dreams from that perspective you start having the ahas so dreams own like you don't have to read my books even though of course i'd love you to and for everybody to buy all my books but the truth is, is that it's always putting the power back to you. You know how to do this naturally. It's just sometimes we need to remember. Sometimes we need to read a book about dream interpretation and dream work in order to, to have that. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like a friend of mine grew up in Quebec. So she grew up speaking French, but she moved to the U.S. when she was a little girl, like four or five. But she was telling me that recently she was with people that spoke French and this and it just came out of her. And she was like, I don't speak French, but I was speaking French. So it's just like that. Like we all speak dream. We all speak that language, but sometimes we just need to be around people that are speaking that language, or we need to be triggered by something in our life to like have it come back to us. Mm -hmm. Why is it so metaphoric, right? Like sometimes I just wish, wish my dreams were so straightforward. And so <laughs> like, Hey man, you gotta go do this, right? Like instead I'm getting like symbols and I'm, you know, characters come into play that, that represent a part of myself, right? Like, why is it so yeah. metaphoric? Such a great question. And, and sometimes they are every once in a while, we'll, we will get a text message in a dream or a billboard or somebody just saying, knock that off <laughs> or wake up or stop that or do this. And sometimes we, we will get the gift of something so simple like that. But you're right. Most of the time they're, they're metaphorical. And if you think about it on one level, it's pretty genius that they speak to us in the, in metaphor, because for example, if I, if I told you when a door closes, a window opens, like that's just a tiny little phrase, but it means like I could write chapters about what that means. Like the thing in your life that you're trying to do just ain't working. So stop it. Something mm -hmm. else is trying to come to you. But, and I, I mean, it takes so many more words to describe this phenomenon of a door closing and a window opens. So that's a symbol. It's elegant. It's like, it's like that. A pig flies in a dream. We could, again, I could, I could write a whole book about what does it mean if you see a pig fly, but in a sim, but we get what symbols mean, like a pig fly, that means, oh my God, my dreams can come true. The impossible could be possible. Wait, uh, uh, so we naturally do speak symbolically. We use these figures of speech all the time, but we forget when we, so it's important, I think, to, ta to talk about our dreams out loud, because when we hear ourselves use those words, like somebody was just talking about, somebody was making me tie a rope, and then all of a sudden I was at the end of my rope, oh, wait a minute, I'm at the end of my rope, I'm at the end of my resources, <laughs> so sometimes you just have to hear yourself talk about what's happening in the dream, and you'll start to notice the word play. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to make sense. And it's actually, so it's kind of like, a, I don't know if you remember those old bouillon cubes. People used mm -hmm. to make soup out of these teeny little cubes, tiny, 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 like the size of your thumbnail. You put mm -hmm. it in hot water and it makes a whole pot of soup. Mm -hmm. So one dream symbol is like a bouillon cube that has mm -hmm. so much information. So it's really pretty intelligent communication, if you ask me. Yes, but if we don't know, we don't know, right? We don't know what our dreams can tell us if we are not open or conscious of their of their meanings, right? So what are some practical tools that we can utilize to start understanding our dreams better? So one of the things is is 
to talk with other people that are interested in dreams, to have conversations like this. I mean, one one way to start interpreting dreams and start thinking about dreams, I always like to say, and this isn't just a shameless plug, but to read books on dreams. It doesn't have to just be my books. It could be anybody's books, but of course I recommend mine. Mm -hmm. But if you read them before you go to sleep, especially I would say like the chicken soup for the soul dream books, because they're short stories. They're like a page or a page and a half. And they're about stories of, of ordinary people that didn't pay attention to dreams, but they just had one dream that they did something with and it changed their life. So you'll start to go, Oh, I want to remember a dream. It'll start to give you FOMO. You'll start to get a little jealous of the people that won the lottery because of a dream or found the love of their life or healed their disease or com were communicating with Jesus or the Dalai Lama or a departed loved one. And you're gonna be like, well, I want that. I wanna be superhuman too. I wanna be, ex I wanna have this superior self experience. I wanna be able to do these things. Mm -hmm. So part of it is just developing that, that desire and with the desire, just like with anything, the desire takes you about halfway there. And then how to interpret it from there is to write down the dreams that you do remember. Don't blow any of them off. Don't believe that any dream is a throwaway dream. Every single dream, it's like a lottery number. It's like the lottery ticket, like don't toss it out just because it looks a little strange. And then pick up a book of mine or somebody else's and interpret those dreams or just ask yourself. I mean, I have a jet set formula that I can that I can talk about if you want me to. It helps people to learn how to break sure. down a dream. Yeah, yeah, so he, yeah. here's a quick way of, of looking at dreams. So if you absolutely have no idea what your dream is telling you, but you write it down anyway, then this little formula will help you kind of know what to do with it. So Jet Set, J-E-T-S-E-T, -E -E it's an acronym, because dreams are meant to help you fly. And people that are in the Jet Set fly a lot. So J is for just the facts, ma'am. This is where you just write down exactly what you remember from the dream without without judging, without trying to figure it out, just whatever, write it all down. And then the E is for the primary emotions. And sometimes there will be several. You'll start off with awe and wonder, then there might be fear or whatever. So just notice the primary emotions that you're feeling. And then T is for the title as if it were a movie and then it, some people like to give it a subtitle as well, because sometimes this, the subtitle tells you even more than the title. And it's the first thing that comes to you. And then the S is for the standout symbols and what they mean to you. So what does a flying carpet mean to you? What is a dragon to you? What is a candle to you? What is, you know, a rope? Those kind of things. And ha is any of that, does any of that seem to make sense? Like, is it bumping up against anything that's happening in your waking life. So mm -hmm. just identify those things. And then the next E is the big word, it's enlighten. How might this dream be trying to enlighten you? The, the rest of the question is based on what may be going on in your life right now. So if the dream, that, so one way to be able to connect these dots is from, from the emotion. So where in your life might you be feeling that way? Are you stressed? Are you anxious? Are you excited? Are you overwhelmed? And so what might that dream be connected to? And you can tell by the feeling. And how is it trying to enlighten you? How is it trying to give you a gift? Like if a door is closed, a window is open, it might be saying, dude, stop trying to go down that road, turn left and go down that other road mm -hmm. or open that other opportunity. And then the T, the final T is for take it to the streets. This is basically what's the action step. How will you get really this is where you get to be very logical and very like forget your logic up until the very end this last piece is what are you going to do in the physical universe to be able to actualize your dream even if it's just like well i was wearing that weird mickey mouse hat that i had when i was a kid i still have it in my closet maybe i'll put it on and see what that conjures or maybe i'll call that girl that showed up in my dream or check her out on social media and see like who what's so there's some physical step there was one woman in one of my dream groups that dreamt she was riding a bike and there was all this like magical stuff that happened. She said, you know, when I said, what's your take it to the street? She's like, well, I guess I'll go to the beach and rent a bike. I don't own a bike. So she went down to the beach, rented a bike. 
And while she was there, she met another guy, a guy that was also renting a bike and they ended up riding together and they, and they're married now. So you never know, like the action step is really like an important piece because that always will lead to something kind of magical. Kind of like you and your husband, right? Like you were, how you guys met? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Kind of like that. You referring to the producer who wouldn't sleep with me, that story. Yeah. What chapter is that in the book? Oh, I don't know what number that is. I mean, he is, so. he's got a couple of shout outs in this bad boy. He's I got a lot about. of shout outs. He's been there for most of these crises. Not all of them, but many of them. Oh my God. Should I tell that story, Trey, or should I let you tell it? Uh, well, I, I love that story, but I also want to yeah. tap into yeah, the, let's... I want to tap into the when the ambulance 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 oh. my Baltimore accent ambulance ambulance right blared for me. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you're into NDEs, so yeah. this is well. Okay, so let me see. The long story short is, it was my 40th birthday. It was eight eight two thousand eight, and oh. um, yeah. And I knew this is going to be a special day. <laughs> Oh, I had yeah. no idea. <laughs> I was out to dinner with some friends and I was starving. And um, from a, there's a whole backstory, but basically we're at dinner and my friend says, oh, I made some cookies and she's an amazing chef. Everything she's ever made is just the most delicious thing. And I'm like, oh, so she cut up this cookie into four pieces, me, my husband, her and her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And so I just gobble my piece down. And she's like, I should, I should have told you it was special. I'm like, what do you mean special? Everything you make is special. She's like, uh, there's a little something, something in that. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I had a tiny piece, you know, and it's a cookie. Like what, what could it possibly do? I had never had an edible and I'm pretty much a total lightweight when it comes to any, any mind altering substances, or at least I was back then. (laughs) Anyway, so we have dinner it's great and about an hour later all of a sudden the room begins to spin and i it it felt like there was a train like a locomotive coming through my head and it was so intense that i felt myself pass out i and i was like kind of fighting with it and i left my body and i kind of fell over onto my husband's shoulder. So nobody knew, nobody at the table knew my hair was kind of covering like my face. So nobody, everyone just thought I was being cuddly with my, with my husband. They had no idea that I had left. And I was like shot out of a rocket to another dimension. Hmm. And I could break this down. I could make this long story even longer, but I'll do the sort of truncated version. I want to know more about this. I want to know (laughs) like, so many details. It's ridiculous. I mean, literally I could write an entire book about every little granular detail, but for the sake of this, I'll just say that there was this tremendous, like, Oh, the word was relief. I had no idea that I had been feeling so heavy that the weight of this world, even though I'm a happy person, I'm pretty buoyant. I'm pretty light compared to the average person, I would say, but compared to what my spirit felt like, I had weighed like 5 million pounds and I was like, Mm. so released and liberated. And I was just floating through like the Aurora Borealis, like colors and sights and sounds. And it was, it wasn't like a drug trip. It felt like it was me just on another like I was, I was out of my body and I started to, I, I realized that there was no end to the love, no end to the beauty. It was so all encompassing. And I had this, this kind of laughing moment because I, cause I was like looking around and it was just like, everything was so beautiful. And I thought if I was back in my human form, I would try to grab some of this stuff and like wrestle it down and like own it but i thought my god my human self is so dense because my human self for doesn't realize that there is always so much good coming in that i never have to grab onto anything that there's like there's nothing to grab i realized that the best thing i could do is to just absorb it all 
Hmm. and let it wash through me. Because the moment I let it go, there was going to be something more and more and more. And I remember telling myself, if I get to go back into my body, I have to remember this, that I don't ever have to grab onto anything. There is so much love, so much beauty. And then strangely, I kind of, once I got so maxed out on the beauty and the love, I thought, I want to understand the nature of darkness. I want to, and, and I don't, I don't write about this in the book, but I, I go into some pretty dark places where I wanted to, from this place of light, I wanted to look at why was there a Holocaust? Why was there Manson? Why was there Dahmer? Why, 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 why? Why do babies die? Why do, like, what the hell? And I got this infusion of understanding all of it. And even though the human part of me I could understand why it would feel tragic from this perspective. It was all just experience. And it was like, and it all kind of made sense in the larger hologram of things and the things that people had to learn and the things that, and I realized that the people that had been victimized by horrible things, basically they were fine, but the people who had inflicted the harm were the ones that suffered the most. So we don't have to work like if people if there's no justice in this world, there's justice on the other side. So we don't have to be so justice minded. Well, we I want to make sure to teach them a lesson. We don't have to bother with that. It happens like the universe has its own balancing act. Anyway, I got like the answers to every questions I I, I had ever wanted to know. I, I got it all. Mm-hmm. And and then I became aware of the pandemonium that was happening in the on the ground floor like with my husband and my the, everyone the, the paramedics had arrived i was on a gurney they had me all wired up to i don't even know but wires and tubes and and i had apparently flatlined and they were um they were taking my i mean i don't even know exactly what they were doing but i became aware that there was so much fear in this space and i tried to get my body to speak words <laughs> <laughs> and this was kind of it was funny to me but not to them but i i said don't worry i'm fine <laughs> they were like ah, what happened to her she's possessed by a demon but it was like standing out like standing out here trying to get in here and make this puppet move mm-hmm. was not easy and i was thinking these people are so dense they think something's wrong they have no idea that this is the most extraordinary thing and they're missing out why don't they tap into my wavelength then they could get some of this oh my god humans are dense (laughs) and my friend moira whispered in my ear and she said kelly i know something really cool is happening with you but I don't care. Get your ass back in your body. And I was like, and then I all of a sudden had this thought about guilt and like, I, how, how is it fair that I'm having such a great time and these people are going to suffer? Like they're going to be, this is like the worst moment for them. And that's not fair. So there was some part of me that was like, I don't want to leave all this. Oh my God. But oh, so I kind of pulled myself into my body and it took a lot. It was Herculean. Mm. It was, it was like, I like to say, it was like pulling in the entire sky into a tiny little teacup. It was like, (laughs) but I grabbed a hold of the paramedic's arm and I said in a sort of more embodied voice, take my bowls. <laughs> <laughs> and they took my pulse again and they were like, oh, okay, okay, we've got her, we've got her. And anyway, so there I was on a gurney on like about to get rolled up into the stretch on, on the stretcher about to go into the ambulance, but I was on the sidewalk in Santa Monica where there's like a thousand people walking around. And the funny thing is though, my friend Ron, who was there took pictures of Mm. this whole thing. And from my perspective, I was just like, you guys, this was so amazing. Why were you so worried? What is the big deal? But when I finally saw the pictures days later, 
I saw what they saw. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, my God. Like, this was a 911 ambulances, lights, and like paramedics. Like, I could feel what they were feeling. And what, and I told myself, okay, never again. Anytime I see an ambulance, anytime I see a paramedic, anytime I see something that looks like it's apparent tragedy, remember that our eyes don't see the whole picture. Mm -hmm. There is a whole other reality going on behind the scenes that might be quite extraordinarily beautiful. So I I do my little ogle formula. I don't know if you want to, maybe we should ogle something of yours. Oh, but... I don't know about that. <laughs> Let's ogle something of yours. Well, Why I, just, not? I want to know more about this near death experience, right? Like I just, uh -huh. we can, we can ogle some stuff here in a minute, but it's like, did anything or anyone meet you when you when you went over into that next dimension, right? Nope. I, so I know th some of the things that happened to like tr traditionally in a near death. I mean, so mine might've been like a, I, I consider it like a mini near death because I w it was very short. I mean, it was probably about 15 minutes, but nobody, I mean, we don't know exactly, but I know that they said that it took a long time. It took about 15 minutes for the paramedics to arrive. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I didn't go all the way, but what's, what typically happens in a near death experience or a death experience, people are immediately enter, they immediately enter the light and immediately there's a guide. I, neither of those things happened for me. The first thing was I was in a tunnel and it, it felt like to the left was fear. And because I was in fear at the time, because I was trying to fight it and I, I was in the, oh no, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. And because I was in fear, I saw where fear would take me and I saw how infinite it was. Mm -hmm. I saw that there was no end to fear. It would just keep like going on. Mm -hmm. I don't need to say more about that, but it was like, oh, okay, let me turn to the right. Let me... Mm -hmm. Let me see. And I started just chanting the word God, 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 because that was the only the only prayer I could muster at that moment. And that whew, it sent me off into this other direction where it was like light and from glory to greater glory to greater glory. And I saw that there's no end to the light as well. So I became more curious about exploring the light and not the darkness. And I don't know most people. I mean, my friend, Daniel Brinkley, who I met later, who I talk about at the end of that story, he's somebody who has died three times and has very long, elaborate death experiences. And they've monitored him and he's been struck by lightning twice and crazy stuff. He's the only one that said, you have a choice where you get to go. So the fear place might be what people would consider hell and the light would be what people would consider heaven, but it's really on a continuum. And it's really just I, I saw that because fear, there was a manifestation of it in that non-physical realm that was just, it's almost like, have you ever been in pain about something like emotional pain, emotional pain? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And somebody says, well, just snap out of it. And you're like, no, I don't want to. Sure. Like, like mm -hmm. don't shake me out of this. I'm not ready yet. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like that. Like I was justified in my fear. I was, I was losing my grip. And so I didn't want to let go of my fear. I had a, I had a right to hold on to my fear. I, you know, anybody would say you are, you're right, Kelly, you have a right to that. And I was like, yeah, I do. I'm going to keep going there until I saw that there was no bottom to that. It wasn't just like a little itch to scratch and then I'd be done. I, I just saw that the darker it would get, the darker it would get. So that's a little thing that was different about my experience where I got actually the choice. Some people, I think when they die, maybe they start off in a very meditative, loving, prayer-filled place. So they don't have that choice necessarily. They're just automatically going to go to a realm that resonates with them, which is, you know, one of the shamanic things that that we're taught is to prepare, like your whole life is a preparation for the way you want to die. You want to have a good death. Mm -hmm. You want to, at that moment that you passed, you want to be ready for it. You want to embrace it so that you don't have to hang out in some of these other realms. You want to get all of that out of your system while you're here so that you're ready for the light. 
But I would say even if you're not, even if you're terrified, I was terrified and I got to have that choice and then I chose the light. Daniel Brinkley talks about one of his near-death experiences. He was he had so much light and he was a bad dude. He was a guy that was living like not not a good spiritual lifestyle at first. He is now much more so for sure. But he said, oh my God, even somebody like me who profits off of doing bad shit, I still went to the light. So, oh my God, we all get a shot at the light. He thought for sure he was going to hell. So he might as well have fun while he's here and party hardy and take whatever he could get. He had no idea that the light was available to him. Mm -hmm. But after a while of being introduced to so much light, he decided on his third death experience to explore the other realm. And it was terrifying. Sure. But he said, yeah, they it all exists. But, you know, it's based on what we're interested in and our curiosity and what we want to be the anthropologist of for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Going to that place and experiencing the light, has it changed your perspective on what this reality is? A hundred percent. I I would like to say that I've never had a bad day or a bad moment since then. I've never had, you know, but if you read my book, you see, no, I've had my, I've had my moments since then, but I, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's become a part of my consciousness it's like a tattoo on my brain that i can't ever forget so when people i i love my pets my best friends family members that when they pass even though there's the human part of me that grieves and cries and all of that there's some part of me that is like but i know where they're at and it doesn't it doesn't create a morbid like sometimes when somebody dies in our lives we go down this morbid we go into a really depressive state because we think, well, what's the point of being alive? I don't go there because I know there's a point in being here. It's sacred to be here. We don't want to rush out of this life. It'll be soon enough that we'll get to the other side. We want to milk every moment for all it's worth. But there was one quote that, that I found like a day or two after I came back that kind of sums up what I learned. Can I sure, share that? Absolutely. Yeah. So the philosopher William Blake wrote this quote and I said, oh my God, this is exactly what I want to remember from the other side. He said, he who binds himself to joy does the winged life destroy, but he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Mm. So I'll say it one more time. He who binds himself to joy does the winged life destroy but he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise in other words when we become attached to the people to the circumstances that we think i need to have this i need you to love me i need to have this accomplishment i need to have this this thing to make me feel safe all of that means that that joy is going to slip right through our fingers because we can't hold joy in fact we can't hold safety security all the things that we want cannot be held by us they can't we the more we hold it the more we it, it evades us but just like when i laughed at myself on the other side when i thought oh my god if i was human i would try to grab onto this but i need to remember this is the same as it is on earth there's a constant flow of love beauty, abundance, it never, ever stops. We don't ever, ever, ever have to grab onto any of it. We can be present for it completely and let it have its way with us and enjoy it. And then if it, if it wants to go, then let it. If a person wants to go, let them. If a job, if a situation, whatever, if it, if it goes, then it's okay, bye-bye, because there's, that just means something better is coming in. And that, that, if nothing else, that one thing has changed my life because it's the, the only suffering that happens as a human is the grabbing onto and something leaving us. 
if you, if if we look at any time we've ever suffered, it's always because we're trying to hold on to something that is trying to leave. And every time we're blissed out is because we're trusting that there's an endless supply and it's all here and I've got more than enough. And that is possible even when the shit's hitting the fan, mm. even in the most horrific moments, it's possible to be in that ecstatic state of bliss if we're just simply not attached and we're present to the love that is there because there's always love there. So of course that is is a big takeaway and that's mm. informed my dream work. It's informed everything. So I'm not the same person that I was before, even though, you know, kind of the same, but a better version, I would say. Sure. So yeah, I mean, to your point, right? Like I look at it as we can have an intimate relationship with the universe or source or God, and it is aware of us because mm -hmm. we are directly connected to that. And I feel like we get so bummed out when we go through the hard times in our lives because we feel alone, we feel disconnected, and we feel like the, everything is happening to us. But if we have a different perspective mm -hmm. that this is happening for our development because we are directly linked to source, to God, to the universe, and that it has, it has a investment in us. Yeah. Right? As mm. we grow, it grows, right? So it wants us to, to grow that inner strength because when we do that, it helps is that consciousness. Me? Oh, that might oh. be me. Okay. That might be me. Phew. I have like my kids, <laughs> my kids are probably in there, you know, doing something on tablets and then like stealing my internet. Hey kids, daddy's working. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> We're attached to this connection. Arr! <laughs> I'm attached to this conversation. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I feel like source has this investment in us in this lifetime to mm. test us, to, you know, to help us through this life, but also as we evolve, it evolves, it expands because mm. I don't feel like God is perfect. I feel like God is ever evolving. Like we are that constant evolution. It just makes sense to me. It just mm -hmm. consciousness is always evolving, is always expanding is always experiencing and i feel like that is us but like to your point we get so attached on things because we fear loss we fear like we'll never have that again we'll fear that we're never going to be able to receive that type of happiness ever again but if we are too too attached to a certain outcome we can never experience it. we can never experience anything more or better because we're so focused in on that result it's it is the human conundrum it is it is the very thing i mean the buddhists call this world that we live in samsara the world of suffering because this is where we become attached and it's not just when difficulties happen i mean there's some people i know that their darkest moments have been when great things have happened to them i mean and i even you know honestly in the in the launching of this book i'll even say just very transparently my book is super transparent it's very like ah so i might as well just keep it going but you know i've been working on this book in like on it's been an internal journey writing is a very internal kind of a communication with with the divine and now the book is out and i'm interfacing with people and, 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 and like, are they going to like it? Are they going to think I'm crazy? Are they going to, am I going to get run out of town? Because I developed this brand over all these years as Dr. Dream, somebody very respectable. And, but I'm putting these stories in there because I don't want to be a walking contradiction. I don't want to have that imposter syndrome anymore. I want to have the, if you're going to love me, I want you to love me because you know everything about me, not just because you like one little speck. And then I feel like I have to live into that, but I've, but it's been external and I've had to, and because it's a book launch, I really want my publisher to be proud of me. So I was like, oh my God, I hope it does well on Amazon on the launch. And it's like, did it get to be number one? Oh my God, it finally did. It got to be hot new release. 
number one hot new release that it was like hallelujah on that but the process of looking outward externally I noticed myself stepping into samsara, stepping into the world of attachment. And Mm -hmm. I could tell my energy starting to like go down and me starting to get tired. And I had the aha a couple of days ago. Oh my God, I need to remember what I learned when I was on the other side to not be attached. It's so simple and yet it's so elusive. It's almost like, I mean, we could go our whole lives and never have that aha moment or have that aha moment and then go, that was nice, whatever, let me go back to real life. But it's, then it's, it's, you know, to live a lucid life is to, mm-hmm. is to not, is to be in that place of de- being committed to being here, but being detached. In the world, not of it. Truly. In the world, not of it. It's like that comfort zone analogy, right? Like you're in this comfort zone and you're in the circle and everything that you know is here, everything you're comfortable with is here life is good but outside the circle is infinite possibilities of what you could possibly be but to get through that line that inner lining is pain is fear is confusion is doubt and Mm -hmm. you need to break through that and it's not it outside is unknown when i talk about infinite possibility i mean yes failure failure can be out there too we don't know Mm -hmm. that's why we stay in a little comfort zones but I feel like when we make that commitment, when, when we make that choice to go outside of ourselves to help expand who we are, good or bad, whatever label you want to put on it, mm-hmm. consciousness, God, the universe will come and guide you, will come and guide you because it has a direct investment in you as consciousness, because when you grow, it grows. So good or bad, however you want to label it, you get outside of your comfort zone there's always going to be help. You're never alone. Mm. Mm. You're never alone. And, and I mean, look, mm. look at where you're at right now, where you stand, like looking back on this book, Dr. Dream, right? Mm-hmm. Near death experiences, loss of loved ones, mm. marriage, mm-hmm. death, mm-hmm. all of that, right? All of that life is beautiful. All of that life is hard. It's, somebody can say it's hard. Some people can say it's beautiful, but at the yeah. end of the day, at the end of the day, it's experience and what you've done for the universe, just in your story here on earth, you've expanded it so much more than it ever was before. Mm. Mm. That is such a beautiful perspective, Trey. I love that. I think, I mean, this is like the second or third time you've you've said something along those lines about having this sort of relationship with the universe this like this perspective that the universe is invested in us and that it's it's friendly and it's on our side and that i think that perspective i just don't want to i just don't want that to get lost it's so i think that point of view is what makes all the difference because it's like you're not in an adversarial relationship with life Mm -hmm. or even with the unknown. I mean, I was talking to somebody about about the shadow, the nature of the shadow, because I'm, as a dream expert, I deal with a lot of people's nightmares and nightmares are related to the shadow. And, And I had this aha not that long ago. I was like, wait a minute, most people think of the shadow. It's like if there's a pie and like 90% of the pie is the light and what we're aware of, what we know about ourselves. And then there's this little sliver called the shadow, but in fact, it's flipped. The truth is, is that the shadow is 99.9999999% of reality. And what we know to be true, what we've, what we've learned and what is our knowledge, our wisdom, is like 0.00001%. So really life is the shadow and the shadow being the unknown, that which has not been yet integrated into ourselves. It's so if we, I think our, we become less afraid of embracing that shadow or exploring that space. If, if we have some sense that, that, it loves us. 
it's kind of like if you if you go traveling to a foreign place. Have you ever traveled anywhere? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Different city, different country. I like was just where? in Santa Monica in August. Santa Monica, California. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, imagine um, if you before you went, if somebody said Trey, oh my God, I'm a world class psychic. I know everything, and I'm never wrong. Everyone in Santa Monica loves you. I mean, even if they don't know it consciously, but literally every shopkeeper, every barista, every 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 person you see is madly in love with you. Shh, don't tell them. But I just want you to know that hmm. you'd show up in Santa Monica like, hey, hey. hey guys, <laughs> <laughs> who's here? It's Trey. <laughs> and even if they weren't like, hey, Trey, you'd be like, that's OK. I know you love me. Mm -hmm. You're just having a bad day. That's OK. But the converse is also true. If before you went, I was like, Trey, everyone there has fangs and they're evil and they hate you. They hate, they hate everything about you. Oh my God, you're taking your life in your hands. It's going to be horrible. Like you would show up there all defended and protected and people, it would, it would tend to evoke mm -hmm. the defensiveness. And so you, it's done unto us as we believe. So if we, it doesn't hurt to imagine this world loves us and that doesn't make us foolish. I mean, I've had a lot of, a lot of things happened to me, but I've, I've survived and I'm still here and it doesn't hurt. Like there's a Malcolm Gladwell book. He's the same guy that wrote the book Blink and the tipping point is newest book, I believe is talking to strangers. And he did all this research and he said that basically like something like 99.5% of people are good people. Mm -hmm. Yes there are some people that we will encounter that really are diabolical but that mm -hmm. but it's it may be one person that you're going to meet in your whole life maybe a couple so most of the time we could walk around thinking people really friggin love us <laughs> even if they don't know it <laughs> well i mean you think about this right like what if on the other side right those people that are diabolical that are here are our yeah. like arch rivals yeah. What if they are the ones over there that love us the most and that they were Ooh. like, all right, I'm going to come here and be that asshole and I'm going to be mm. that jerk off and I'm going to be the guy that's going to fire you. I'm going to be the guy that beats you. I'm going to be the guy that terrorizes your entire family because I love you so much to do that. I completely 100% agree. And that, I mean, that take that's like the radical love perspective. I mean, that's taking it up to the 2.0 for sure. I mean, I think now, I mean, the, the story I talk about at the beginning of my book is this Me Too m movement mo moment. I can't even say it because it's so like, uh, when I was this guy who kind of manipulated me and, and he was my manager, he was going to make me a star. I was 20 years old and and he got me to move in with him. And I was just completely, and like, I'm not stupid. I wasn't stupid back then, but he was really good. And turns out now I find out that there were all these women. There was a whole, some kind of a blog with all these women that were like, did you ever meet this guy? Did he, and it was the same story for all these women. For, and he just passed away the day that my book, like the day I turned my book in. Wow. But wow. when I think about him, like he's the one that got me gave me the idea that I should be a stripper. And it's a long story. And I write about it in another book called Stripped that will come out at some point. It's being shopped as we speak. But it was the most, like, ever, it was the worst experience I'd ever had. Like, the whole year was just, it was the, the worst things that I could ever imagine. But I think now, oh, my God, if it wasn't for him, I would have a completely different life. And I love the life I have today. Mm -hmm. What if, what if he was one of my angels? Ooh, that's a big pill to swallow, but. But as a human, he, right? Like as the human mind get, cannot yeah. wrap itself around that saying, oh, yeah. trust me, there's people in my life that I'm like, man, if he's my spirit guide, <laughs> that bastard. <laughs> Yeah, like, <gasps> can I trade in? 
Can yeah, I get yeah. another one? You're really Just... good at being bad, dude. You're really good. You tricked me. You got me. But they're the it, Carlos Castaneda. Um, are you familiar with him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this there's this term called the pinche tiranito. Mm. And <laughs> the petty tyrant. It sounds like it's a little thing, but it's a big thing. And Carlos Castaneda's teacher was Don Juan. And Don Juan said to Carlos Castaneda when he found him bloody on the street, having been beaten by this tyrannical slave owner, basically, who abused him. And the this healer tends to him and he gets him so he can finally talk. And she said, what, what would happen? And he tells him, oh, my God, I was beaten. I was this was horrible. And he goes, ah, oh, you got a good one. Mm -hmm. You got to go back. <laughs> It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, they don't come that good anymore these days. Like, the, we need these people in order to initiate, in order to have that radical waking up. But it's not a guarantee. I mean, the, the late, great Barbara Marks Hubbard, who was a great teacher of mine, she, her whole body of work was about quantum evolution. And she studied the work of Teilhard de Chardin, the French philosopher who won the Nobel prize for his theory of the dissipation of structures. And it's basically studying what happens when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Hmm. And the notion is that it's never a guarantee that the caterpillar is gonna become a butterfly. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes it dies before it becomes a butterfly. So when we go through a crisis, it's not a guarantee that we're going to come out better on the other side. Because if we wanted to, because we have free will, I believe that we have free will. I know some people argue with me on that, but I think we do. If we wanted to, like we in any in a, in a crisis, we're at a choice point. And if we wanted to, just like I had that choice point, I could go down that fear path and keep on going, or I could go down the other path, but we have a choice. We can become bitter or better hmm. based on what we choose. We could become the butterfly version of ourselves, or we could just melt into a pile of goo and, and, and die as a caterpillar. It's not guaranteed. And that's why it's, that's why I wrote this book really, because I know for me, I've had to continuously make the choice. I want to be better. I want this to make me better. If I'm gonna go through this, then I want this to make me better. And I want this to uplift on, on behalf of like other people as well. Like anybody else who struggles or suffers in this way, if I'm gonna be lifted, let us all be lifted. But it's possible. It's not everybody goes that way. So we, we do have to engage our will. I mean, you could make up the story that everyone in Santa Monica hates me or everyone in Santa Monica loves me and you're going to have a very different experience. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. I could talk to you all night. Um, <laughs> I know, Trey. Oh my God. Where's the time flown? Time's fun when you're back having flies. On so we can talk about, <laughs> we got so many different topics we needed to discuss. One, hypnotherapy. Two, the, yeah. produce, the producer who wouldn't sleep with you um oh. <laughs> and a couple more um there's another one that um your your daughter that you're um lined up to adopt i would definitely wanted to touch on that so i knew you were gonna say that i knew you yeah. were gonna bring that one up you yeah next time need to, need to come back on to discuss these topics i would be oh. honored trey you have this has been so not an ordinary interview i love your style and your just such a cool dude. And I love that you bring your full self into it. It's not like you're removed from the conversation. You're like in it and I can feel that. So this is, this is different for me. And I re I've been doing a ton of these and this is so refreshing and it's really, really feeding my soul, mm. helping my butterfly wings grow stronger being in your presence. So I, I appreciate it. you. I love it. I love it. I love Thanks it. for being on this date with me. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm glad I stuck around, right? I didn't, I didn't hightail it. I didn't leave. Like, where are you going? Where, where are you going? going? I got to go. Sorry. Somebody's calling me. I got to go. Check, please. Check, please. Check. <laughs> Kelly, 
what's the website? Where can people find the book? Where can they get it? My website is my name, Kelly Sullivan Walden.com. But if that's too hard to spell, you can go to I had the strangest dream.com. Mm. And you can get my book, A Crisis is a Terrible Thing to Waste, The Art of Transforming the Tragic into Magic. You can get it anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. You can get it on Beyond Words there. That's my publisher. You can get it on their website as well. And um, for your listeners, Trey, so this, so the launch happened a week ago, and I have this this offer, this special offer for people, um, but I took it off my website because the launch is now complete. But anybody who's listening or watching your show, I'd say till the end of February, if they contact me, um, Kelly at KellySullivanWalden.com and they want the $500 worth of additional bonus gifts that I have for people who buy the book. If they buy a copy of the book and send me their order number, I will send them a link to $500 worth of bonus gifts. Is that does that include me? That, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on, $500. Trey. $500. Send Get me an email. Here. Yeah, $500 worth of bonus gifts. I'm not sending you $500. $500 worth of bonus gifts. Yeah. I'm saying $500 worth value. Value yes. $500. Yeah, mean, yeah, come yeah. On. Can't beat that. Yeah. And if any of your listeners want to join me in Costa Rica in June, I'll also take $500 off of the the price of the retreat what? yep if you i mean with the price you have to buy a book though because we're all i you know, all i hear is five hundred dollars five hundred i like fives everything i do has a five in it five, five, <laughs> so, five. yeah kelly this has been awesome um last question really quick and this might yes. be a tough one just to, oh my god this might be a tough one i'm scared is this the dream <sighs> absolutely mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I can't, Absolutely. I, I can't wait to have you on again because I definitely <laughs> have so much more to go off of. <laughs> Trey, you're a blast. You're so much fun. Thank you so much. I can't I wait feel to much more connected again. to my superior self Ooh, being in your that. presence. I love that. Kelly thank Walden, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Trey. Mm -hmm.